Because that's really what the history of capitalism has been. One revolution in social arrangements, technology, workplaces, uh, areas of profit, production centers. It's just been one revolution after another. It, uh, I think Schumpeter, Joseph Schumpeter, the Austrian economist, said it well, that capitalism is about creative destruction. And we get the creative part, which is wonderful, and all these new technology, and, uh, but we sometimes forget the destructive part. Every invention that succeeds wipes out its predecessor. And this means a change in where people work and, and the skills they have to have. Um, the, so it, and it never stops. I mean, as we know, having lived through 2008 and 2009, we, we had sort of this whammy out of nowhere. I mean, now we realize it wasn't out of nowhere, but that's what it seemed like. And, and that's a part, I would say, of the relentless revolution, going from a great boom time to a burst bubble. I define capitalism as a system um, in which private individuals uh, make take initiatives with their own capital to uh, usually to enhance production, but to produce something that they can sell on the market for a profit. And I, I give that definition, and, and it seems so ordinary, and yet every element in that definition was an affront to the established customs and traditions of the society in which capitalist practices began. Individual initiative, in a, in a society of scarcity, which all traditional societies were, they were always under the threat of famine, you didn't have a lot of individual initiatives. It was like a, a sinking ship. You, you stayed in your place, and you did what you were told because they were so uh, close to the edge in their capacity to produce food. So that individual initiative would seem very dangerous. And then uh, the idea of it's being private, extending the private sphere. This is a traditional economy in which the government didn't produce things, uh, pr produced on land that was owned by yeomen or lords or whatever and, and worked by tenants and some private farmers. Uh, so it was privately owned, but the government controlled it. There's these great laws against um, uh, regrading, forestalling, and regrading, forestalling, and one other, which is meant that, that, that when the crop was in, you couldn't hold it off the market for a better price. You couldn't uh, sell it to brewers if the government said that they needed it for food. You had to take it to the market on a certain day and sell it. So that was a lot of control, but now you have private capital going where the owner of it wants it to go. And uh, th those are just very disruptive things. Enhancing production is another way. You don't enhance production without assaulting old customs and, and ways of working. I can put a century on it. I started in England. Um, and I, as you know, I don't think capitalism was inevitable. I think it was a very propitious convergence of trends and and developments and, and some fortuitous events. I put it in the 17th century because the core of capitalism was discovering um, new machine, developing new machines on the basis of the new science that greatly accelerated the amount that could be produced by any worker. And this work was done in the, it's what we you know, think of in the natural philosophers of Galileo and Newton and, and Boyle, and they discovered that atmosphere had weight, and they discovered uh, that there uh, uh, was no, uh, that, that there was a vacuum, that natural laws are uniform, and these ideas uh, as I say, might have just maintained within a, an intellectual elite, but in England had a very open society. And so these advances in science just advanced right into the workshops of a Thomas Newcomen or a James Watt who perfected the steam engine. I mean, I just think, how many people through the ages must have seen boiling water push up the top? So, you know, and yet it took all these centuries for what? For the theories that explained it, for the um, mechanics who had the ingenuity and desire. Uh, it, it was a propitious linking of technological advances with economic opportunity in a very supportive social environment. But England had already solved the problem of food shortages, and that was key. It didn't cause capitalism, but it made it possible. The Dutch were great 
innovators, but the Dutch were financiers and, and traders. That's what they did well. They, they acquired in, in Amsterdam, the cities of, the, of, of uh, the Netherlands, they just had storehouses of everything beautiful that was made in the world as well as, as timber and, and grain. They made themselves the great carriers of the world. And they, they um, innovated with banking and finance. They, they had, char had interest rates of two, three, four percent, when everywhere else in the world it was 12 percent. Well, of course, this is what startup companies need. They need access to capital at, at a low rate. So the Dutch were important, but the Dutch had one problem. They could only feed themselves through nine months of the year, so they had to import for three months of the year. And this had, this, I think it crimped their imagination. I don't think they could see the possibilities of the systems that they had started, whereas the English exported food. They, they, they were uh, well enough developed in agriculture that they didn't have to worry after they'd gone through this century of improvements. Um, the Dutch also were satisfied. They were, they were, you know, fat and happy. So they weren't pushing to change what they did well. What was remarkable about England and why you have capitalism is that they, once they started, they never stopped. They kept innovating with new developments, applying it to different productive processes, you know, everything from uh, um, drilling mining shafts to making porcelain. My father was a, a, worked for United States Gypsum, and he was in sales, and he was actually moving to bigger offices. I got my master's degree at the University of California, Santa Barbara. I was there, living there with my husband, and we had an ad agency in Santa Barbara. And uh, I was very lucky because they just initiated a master's program, or I would not have been able to get it. I got that Claremont Graduate School, and again, it was within 10 miles of my house. By this time, I had three children, so I had a very short tether. But fortunately, it extended to a place that, that provided graduate education. I did. I do. I do. Uh, he's a, sort of a man of leisure. He's a, he, he learns and remembers. He's, he's a kind of fantastic what he knows. And it was just wonderful. He lives near me. It was wonderful to be able to talk to him about this because he never, ever lost his curiosity in capitalism. And I would bring up some subject, and he would go on to amplify. I think I mentioned that Sarnoff was a, went to, to Japan and was celebrated. Frank was one that told me that he was one that received the message from the Lusitania. I mean, just always these little, I taught there for 14 years, and then I uh, came to UCLA. No, no, I retired seven years ago. I started it, it took me two years, and, it's, and, and then there was a copy editing process, so I guess I started it, what we now maybe four, four years ago this summer. Um, I knew a lot about the first part, because I'm an historian of early uh, modern Europe. And I'd done a book on economic thought in England, which meant that I had to understand economic developments as well. Um, and then after that, when we got into, well, you get into the Industrial Revolution, I was by no means a, an authority on that. Um, I simply read. I, did, you know, I did, did what scholars did. But the th interesting thing was that I, n I never thought of it as a book for scholars. I thought of it as a book for a general public, and that was so liberating. I, I didn't think of all those critics who were going to be arguing with my thesis. I just thought of general readers eager to learn about the history of capitalism, and it, it truly was fun to write. Yes, there were a lot of things, a lot of things. I mean, I didn't know, for instance, much about Germany in the 19th century, and yet when I saw that both the United States and Germany had passed the front leader, the pioneer, England, I became very interested in how the Germans did this. And what was curious and what made a real impression on me as I developed the book was how different the United States' economic development and political development, too, was from that of Germany. So here were these two different paths towards capitalist leadership and excellence with different strengths, different leaders, uh, truly a different M.O. And that, that made me realize that because capitalism, as I stress, is a cultural system, it wears a different face in every country. The Germans, for instance, were, were uh, struggling, well, the Prussians were struggling to create a nation 
in, in Germany, and they started off with the Zollverein. They started off with a custom service, and so they they use the economy to create this uh, unity, which they finally, through Bismarck, they finally achieved with Prussia, which was by far the largest uh, of the 300 principalities and states that composed Germany, um, and. Because they were led by aristocrats, this is one of the interesting features. Uh, the, the well, let me just back up. The, the, the aristocrats were not particularly interested in industry. They were interested in German prosperity, but they had a rather contempt for these industrial magnets, and they. So the industrial magnets couldn't count on the government for financing or banks, and so they arranged to have investment banks. The first investment banks were in Germany, um, in a couple of major cities. Um, the other thing was that the Germans had, had the in center of industry was in the Northwest, and they had to pull people from the uh, poorer parts of Germany as workers in these factories, in the steel factories and the like. Um, but there began to be unrest among the leaders. And here's one of the big differences I'm getting to. I haven't forgotten the question. Um, it, there was an attack, an attempted assassination of the Kaiser. And so there was a clamp down on radicalism. But Bismarck initiated a social welfare program in the 1880s. Workers insurance, workers compensation, pensions and the like. He wanted to buy off, as it were, the radicals. And because he had power, he wasn't stopped by the industrialists who hated this sort of thing. They weren't interested in securing all these benefits for workers. Well, you look at the United States, and we have a very uh, porous safety net. We never have had strong unions, and that means that our social welfare, as we know going through health care debate, has been very, it's been very hard to push on this front. So that's one of the big differences. Mining. In England, uh, mining was important, and they needed they needed pumps first to get rid of the water, and then the steam that 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 fills in in you know in mines, and um, steam engines were more they could use as effective pumps. The initial use of steam, the Newcomen steam engine, just consumed enormous amounts of of uh, coal, so you couldn't leave the coal fields very far. You had to have your industry there, and, and, and mining was there. What James Watt does, half century later, as someone said, he took a, an awkward contraption and turned it into the engine of the Industrial Revolution, is he got a way of getting rid of all that steam and conserving on the coal. Then you could take the steam engines and put them anywhere, in boats, to uh, drive the machinery in Wedgwood's famous uh, porcelain factories. And so uh, I'm, you know, the first is in the late 17th century, and I'm carrying it forward to the end of the 18th century. And it doesn't really change the standard of living until well into the 19th century. Mining, mm -hmm. great bonanza of, of uh, the steam engine was textile making. Textile making, there, there was, cotton was a lot easier to mill than wool, and cotton was in demand all over the world. And the English perfect through the spinning jenny, the power loom, uh, the uh, spinning mule, these various inventions improve the number of spindles that can be run at the same time with the same engines and you know, greatly accelerate the output. So most of England's industrial workers worked in textile factories. Um, you know, that's one of the sort of uh, poignant moments in, in American history, to jump ahead to the 19th century, is that in the Civil War, the uh, English were cut off from southern cotton. They refused to recognize the Confederacy. And the workers are all, you know, thrown off, you know, out of the factory, no jobs. And there is a pressure to get the government to recognize, from the manufacturers, to recognize the South. And the, the workers stand fast, even though they are suffering. They do not want to help slavery. And, and Lincoln wrote a wonderful letter to them, and it's on the base of a statue of, of him in Manchester. It's getting a little off field, but there's so many kind of fascinating stories inside this
epic. I guess I thought that it would be well for the pe person to know who was talking to them and telling them this story. And as I said, I, I wrote it for a general audience. I think people are curious when you deal with a subject like capitalism. Uh, I went on to say that I very much wanted to write this without having characters with black hats and characters with white hats and, and sing the virtues of capitalism or uh, lament its abuses. I wanted to give, not even handed, I just wanted to give a an account that sort of like um, the Friday, Sergeant Friday, <laughs> that told the facts, though obviously I interpret the facts all the way through to give it a, a coherence. What, did it seem strange to you? Well, welfare reform. Uh, it, it, say, what's that got to do with libertarians? Um, I disliked the dependency that I felt was implicit in our welfare system. Um, and that I see as a libertarian of, of wanting people to be free of this kind of dependency. There are quite a few issues in which freedom would be more important to me uh, than social justice in some instances. Social justice is very important. Uh, what was I reading about today? I was uh, an issue that, that, oh, this issue about the, the school um, is it, yes, Hastings. The, the case is coming before the Supreme Court. Uh, Hastings told the Christian League, Students Christian League, that they can no longer have f university facilities or law school facilities because they excluded uh, people whose sexual life was immoral. And, and I, I was thinking, you know, I think they ought to have the right to exclude. You know, I think that's a right of free association. It doesn't seem to me that it's damaging a lot of people. I don't, I don't know whether that seems like a libertarian issue to you, but I weighed against the institution. Oh, well, left-leaning is a lot easier. I'm really, really concerned with social justice. I, I think it's abominable that we don't pay a living wage. That is, when we start paying a living wage to workers all over the world, I bet half of our social problems will be gone. Poverty is such, it's just a bane of people's lives. And, and there are a lot of people who are poor. I mean, it's not a small number. And I, so I guess, I guess being for the living wage is different from not wanting welfare. I want people who work to be able to earn a comfortable living. And, and, I, and I think if you have such an unequal society as we do, the government's got to put money into public goods like concerts for kids and art education and parks and the things that they that they can't get from upper middle class parents the government in that sense of enrichment of a childhood should be doing that and that sort of liberal oh I'm for it I'm for it capitalism has got a great wealth generating capacity we just have to learn we have to do this delicate balancing act of making it regulating where it needs to be but without killing the incentives that fuel it. Well, you know, we didn't do such a bad job after the Depression. We can see now that all that deregulation was a mistake. I, don't, I think that we can get our financial house back in order. I think there'll always be panics or uh, bubbles burst. The reason why there will always be is because capitalism is a system in which no one is in charge. Many people have a lot more power than other people, but no one's in charge. So you can have everybody running off a cliff at once and not know it. Um, I think it's, I don't think it's that difficult to regulate it. I don't think you're gonna do it perfectly. You're gonna have to adjust it with changes. Well, that, as I said, I, I made a little list and that list in part comes from people who are fighting against capitalism, who are critics of capitalism. Amartya Sen, uh, you know, or Mohammed Yunus, or uh, Francis Lepay Moore. I mean, the, um, all those are charges that are made against capitalism. The anti-globalization people say that. I thought it was important to get those all out there because I think they are aspects of capitalism. If we had the political will, we could address every one of those. Maybe not the uh, rewarding aggressiveness, because I, I later thought I should have dropped that, because aggressiveness is important to capitalism. Um, but what we lack is the political will.
to make these changes. And one of the reasons I think we lack this political will is because we've been sold the bill of goods that the economy is an independent system. It's autonomous, self-correcting, works on its own. It's like the weather. Don't try to interfere. I just don't think that's so. It's a cultural system. There's much that we can do to shape it. And this is what I would like to see. I, when you've got 40% of the Ivy League graduates going into finance, as we had up until two years ago, I, I, you'd have to say there's a, is uh, wanting a very high salary greedy? If so, I think that we'd say the money attracted the people. Um, no, I don't think greed is particularly good. I, I, don't, I think uh, moderation. It's like the Greeks and their golden rule is that there's a desire to live comfortably and to work to achieve that. But I think that what we see with greed is when other human values are out of bounds, all the kelter because the greed is so dominant that we're not thinking about the time that we had to, to enjoy our family or to do, I realize enjoy the family is what politicians always say when they, when they resign, <laughs> but people do want to enjoy their family. And uh, so I think the greed as, as an excess, yes. Well, we see two very unusual countries representing 40% of the world's population, India and China, uh, coming along. Of course, the other one is Japan. Uh, much earlier, and I think that Japan moved. It's a really rather small island and not that populated, and it's the number two economy for a long time. Uh, that was quite quite a story. And the Asian story generally, the four little tigers of uh, Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan, and Hong Kong, um, they, they modernized and developed capitalism even faster than Japan. And they all did it, interestingly enough, with a highly directive elite. One of the things that, that all those countries did too was that they had agricultural reform. They got the land out of the hands of passive landlords, put it in the hands of the farmers, poured back money into agricultural education, uh, you know, and as it were kind of bought off any critics of their industrial project because the farmers were doing very well. And then those leaders knew what they had to do to connect with the, uh, in this case, the emerging world of con uh, consumer electronics and, and, and uh, information technology. Well, of course, it's the kind of er uh, analysis and synthesis of capitalism. It was published in 1776, and Adam Smith was a philosophy professor, and he was a Scotsman, and there was a lot going on in Scotland at the time, and he um, had this capacity to just look at this mass of separate little facts and bring them into an organized story of a free economy. This is what he was interested in. He didn't call it capitalism. Um, and he explained how capitalism emerged and, and long accumulation of capital and then the application of the division of labor that enhanced production. Um, and it laid the basis, it laid the basis of economics. It was furthered by David Ricardo and Malthus and other people, but it also laid the basis of this self-correcting economy. Of course, Adam Smith is the one that had the idea of the invisible hand. He said, you know, it, it's not from benevolence that we get bread and beer from the brewer and the baker. It's from their own self-interest in competing to produce a good product at a lower price, and we benefit. And that's been kind of the linchpin of defenders of capitalism ever since. That yes, they have this competition, but there's this invisible hand that makes that competition works for us. And, uh, and Smith has had wonderful anecdotes. He says, for instance, manufacturers never have dinner together but what they set the price of wages. A very ironic way, at a time in which workers, if they had tried to conspire to have an association would have been sent right off to jail. So he has this, he, he's no dummy, he knows what's going on in this world. And um, so I would say I guess I got interested in the subject through Adam Smith. I read Wealth of Nations, I, I guess it, early in graduate school, I probably read extracts in uh, college because I did take some um, economic courses, but I was a graduate student. I would have been in my early 30s. No. No. Because this isn't about economics. That's very important. It's not about economic theory. It's about the development itself. 
the actual transitions, that, not transitions, the actual conflicts, novelties, innovations, struggles over these that gave shape to the capitalism we have today. It's interesting, it had very little impact on the United States. Alexander Hamilton said the idea that markets can run themselves is one of those paradoxical uh, notions that has grown in strength with us during the revolution. It absolutely had nothing to do with it. Um, but it was important in England, and it moves into the early 19th century to become the basis of economic thought. And then economics changes in the, in the uh, end of the 19th century, and there's no longer, they no longer have a labor theory of value. They have a theory that value comes from demand. It's what we will pay when we are just about uh, satisfied with an object, what we won't buy another one for. Um, anyway, so Adam Smith has not been important in modern economic theory, except as a sort of a godfather and as a, uh, a totem, as a symbol, as a name with resonance. So I would say Smith is still important, and I'm sure he's taught in most economics classes. Another Brit. Well, you know, he was another American immigrant, too. Um, because he thought he was going to stay. He didn't know they were going to have all these wonderful revolutions that would call him back to Europe. <laughs> um, Paine was important because Paine had this, uh, w he had such a powerful attack on privilege and political conservatives and traditions. And he was such a polemicist that he really did open people's eyes to the incongruity of being ruled by ideas that are 800 years old or, or political arrangements. And of course, he had an impact on the American Revolution because he came here and immediately, first thing he did was write a tract against slavery, and then he just began writing until he produced common sense. Uh, but Paine was, it was very important. I wanted, to, I wanted to make the point that this 18th century, the century of increasing technological virtuosity, was also accompanied by a new concept of human nature, human possibilities, and the proper ordering of government so that everyone would flourish. And that you have in Paine, and that I think you have in the Declaration of Independence, as you know, drawing on that. I'm not really an advisor. I'm, 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 I'm yes, I am an advisor, but I, they don't ask for my advice very much. They're, they're trying to Get, yes, they are active, um, and they are still working on a, um, I think, a, 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 a um, television series. But they, but they're still active. They, they write letters of editor, to the editor and whatnot. You probably know more about that than I do. You talk to more people, uh, you know. Um, I think history, judging from the books that sell. Uh, I just came from Los Angeles, the Festival of Books the LA Times has. Uh, just you know, 100,000 people or there are more uh, reading books, buying books, listening to people talk about their books. I think there's a lot of interest in history. Uh, what I worry about is the fate of ed higher education in America. This is, I think, we, having achieved an absolutely first class university educational system, just taking the private and the public universities together, we're just resting on our laurels. And their state universities are losing more and more state support. They're going out for private funds, so they're becoming more like private institutions. Tuition, California used to have a virtually free education. It's pretty expensive now. And that that's how it affects students. But the way it affects history is that there is an underfunding of scholarship, and it's, it's um, I don't know, it's very hard to um, promote an intangible, like an understanding and appreciation of history or of art or of literature, and yet they are just fundamental to people's grasp of the world they live in, uh, putting their world in the stream of time. Uh, so in that sense, I'm worried about history. You know, they've been doing these things for a long time. What do you think they would do if you, I mean, it's a tribute to history that they do it, but what do you think the score would be if you went out and tested their knowledge of biology or of chemistry? That, that doesn't bother me so much. Something that bothers me is you have what's going on in Texas now, and that's not university education, it's 
high school and middle school and elementary school where they are rewriting the textbooks along a particular ideological uh, line. And uh, that's, that's troubling. Again, it's a tribute to how important history is that people would take the time to try and put in their ideas of what the revolutionary period was like. It's a, it is kind of a problem because everybody thinks they know history. In other words, it's the accessibility of history that makes people experts. Um, I, I suppose you get around it by having more and more opportunities to confront these people who say certain things about the writing of the Constitution or the pre-Civil War period with people who do know the documents. And so you can have some open forum. You, you're, what you're trying to do is to persuade a third person. You're not going to persuade the historians that they're wrong. You're not going to persuade these people that they're wrong. But it's the spectator that needs to be convinced. And they could only be convinced, I think, by hearing this. Well, if they get people more interested in history education, yes. I mean, I don't know whether they're relevant, but I think they matter. And I think it would be nice if students retain. You know, I'll give you an example. Maybe I've said this before. I used to, when I taught uh, lower division courses, I used to present a constitution that was opposite of our constitution to get them to read the constitution. This was a simple 20 thing, list element. Everybody voted. It was purely democratic through and through, only one house, a legislature. And then I would give it to them in advance and tell them to read both constitutions and come into class and be prepared to uh, take, defend which one you want. I had to beg people to take my constitution. And when they debated, they came up with all the answers, all the statements that were made in the Federalist Papers, which I don't think they'd read, but they knew why, in their view, a bicameral legislature was better. And they knew why you had an independent judiciary. And they knew, and it was very impressive. Now, that told me something more than these polls did, that there is a general understanding of our institutions, but it's not something that you can spit out when someone asks you a question. I was president in 80, uh, Eight, I guess, 89. Um, that is a, an organization for all scholars whose field is American history. So it has people in France who study American history, in Germany who study American history, in Japan, and China. And the other is the, and that's an organization for all the historians in America. I was president of that. Um, you know, I was trying to think when I was president of that. I think it was uh, 97. Yes, it was, 97. They do a lot of good things for history. They obviously do two things that are important to their members. They have an annual meeting where there are all kinds of panel discussion. The latest scholarship is, is discussed. And they put out terrific journals of history scholarship. And the one is just American history, and the other is all kinds of history. Um, but the American Historical Association, in particular, does a tremendous job of defending history in uh, America. Um, whether it uh, might be an historian who is going to be fired because of some provocative study or access to the archives. Um, there have been lots of uh, legal issues in which they have become a party to a case which is going to open up the archives to the public or something to do with the Library of Congress. So they're always, they, they maintain an office here and they're always alert to what it is that scholarship needs. And they do a tremendous job. Well, um, Paul Collier says there are 57 failed states. Now, whether they are not capitalists, I don't know. But they're probably not doing it very well if they're failed states. Uh, so I'll give you those 57. Yes. Well, it started. Um, in this, uh, 78 uh, with the liberalization program. Um, it's, you know, kind of very hard to say when it became. But when you have them allowing peasants to sell their land and put their land up for collateral and farm individually, which happened about in the last 12 years. I mean, they, they promised, said they could only do it for 30 years, but no one thinks they'll ever resume it. That's a major change when you Farming is always key because it involves the most people and the most traditional element in the society. Uh, they've expanded their, you know, free trading zones, their uh, banks. You know, China gets an enormous amount of, what do they call it, of private money from Chinese all over the world. 
and so they have this as a source of investment. Uh, they have, I think they're called money clubs for startups. Uh, there's, they, they still run the big industries, but even those big industries are now being run on a profit basis. And they actually, they're pouring their profits back into to the pension funds, which they don't have. So I would say, I'd say the last 10, 12 years, I think it's going to be hard. And the reason it's going to be hard is because a part of their communism, it's not so much a communism, but their authoritarianism, is controlling information. And information is absolutely critical to capitalist development. This is a fast-moving technological world, and you need to have access to it. And you need, you don't know where innovations are going to come from. Your people need to have access to these things. And I would say, in the foreseeable future, the next quarter century, we're going to see more and more of an easing up. Whether they have a bi-party system, I don't know, but they're going to ease up on the control of individual lives, as they are already. Well, I think, yes, I think uh, Sweden and Finland, I think these countries put in a, have a tremendously uh, strong social net. They, uh, the Gini coefficient, as they say, measuring the inequality. I was looking at The Economist last night on the plane. It's very low in Finland as compared to the United States and Britain's more than the United States, and China and India are worse than the, than the United States in the spread of wealth. But a part of that is a function of the fact that there's so much wealth at the top. Before, everybody was poor. It's not that the poor have gotten poorer, it's just that there are many more well-off people, so you have this spread of inequality. Yes, I would say those Scandinavian countries, you know, probably the Netherlands, um, where they do a, a much better job, uh, a much stronger support of labor, labor participating on corporate boards, um, you know, and they're, and, they're, and they're economically strong and getting stronger. Yes, that's true, by a long shot. They all have now some pocket of guest workers that have stayed put and offer some, <laughs> some variety of the vanilla, which dominates. But that, that is a very important factor. Uh, but I don't think it's insurmountable. Japan is pretty extreme because they really are xenophobic, I think. They really, as I don't, they really are uncomfortable around strangers. But look at it this way. We're heterogeneous, but we're used to that. Does it bother me that I go on the UCLA campus and I can see every skin color in the world? Not at all. I mean, it doesn't, it isn't threatening. So that over time, once we, ex I shouldn't, over time, that's going to be like homogeneity. Now we're still having some difficulty with immigrants um, and concern about them in some parts of the country. Well, this country was tied to the absolute front runner, Great Britain. And so they had been economically active and innovative from the very beginning in Massachusetts and Virginia. In Virginia, unfortunately, it was a slave system, but it's highly capital intensive. In Massachusetts, it was much more plucky entrepreneur. And this meant that it, it fostered this individualism and individual initiative and individual responsibility. Those are kind of the moral, the moral bedrock of, of capitalism. You have to take care of yourself, and then you have to act on your own. So I think they had a lot to do with causing the revolution. People felt competent. They, when the British try and change the rules, they're not at all happy about it, and they're not afraid to oppose it. And so I would say that economic initiative Maybe I won't say capital. Economic initiative was widespread. Economic initiative was critical uh, to the revolution and to the founding of the country. Slavery is a terrible uh, thing. It shows shows what greed will do. There were these profits to be made in in uh, the tropics by growing sugar. Imagine a world without sugar, and all of a sudden they could get sugar. Um, and this led to this really vicious exploitation of labor. What's really, to me, is tragic about slavery is that it weighed on the conscience of these European countries. So what did they do? They blamed the condition on the slaves. It was their qualities. They were sort of Aristotelian. They were meant to be slaves. And this has left this bitter legacy of prejudice, which is put in there in the first place to solve the conscience of the slave owners.
Well, tobacco was, was the underpinning of the southern slave economy, tobacco and rice in, in South Carolina in the 18th century. It was then replaced by cotton, which was even more valuable as an export, more demand for it. So it gave cap, uh, slavery a lease on life. The slavery was going strong all the way up to 1860, but by this time, the conscience of the world and the, and the North was such that there was an absolute insistence that it's not be spread. That's what the Civil War was about, it was not slavery where it was, but it was the spread of slavery. The North said no, and the South was, would not accept that. Um, so I think it had, a, in the long term, a very malign impact. In the short term, it was very important to Northern prosperity because the South concentrated their labor and their land on cotton, and they bought everything else from the North. So this is, you know, it's got this giant buyer, as it were, cheap clothes, cheap shoes, food, barrel staves, the works. I think competitiveness, I think because the major um, employers, what is the major employer? It's Walmart. And they have made a success uh, from a lot of things, from their fascinating use of technology, but also keeping wages low. Um, it's very different from uh, Walter Ruther's day, in which wages were high, and there were all those good good jobs in the steel mill and the auto plants, but America was protected. There wasn't the same competition. There wasn't this flow of capital around the world. So well, I wish Walmart would change its ways and pay more, I recognize that it was in a different economic environment and it succeeded brilliantly in that economic environment. No, I don't think so. I, I mean, there are countries there succeeded, you know, probably went to New Guinea and into tribes or in the Amazon basin. There are groups that feed themselves and have enough of the way of life they want. And that those are economies. Uh, but in terms of prospering, getting more goods, enjoying a higher standard of living, no. Well, you had a brilliant, brilliant strategist who saw all he Sam Walton was just a master of introducing efficiencies. He's like Henry Ford. They're just brilliant organizers. They're not they're businessmen, but they see these possibilities. You know, it, there's a lot of squeezing over prices and wages, but there's also this use of technology, never sending out trucks that don't come back full. They've got, you know, they use information technology to be constantly telling the trucks where to go. You know, they, they, cha they discover that one system of tagging boxes in their yard where they have their inventory isn't as effective as another, they replace the other. And as someone said, Walmart keeps every employee on a very tight um, technological leash. You know, they're, they're, Every sale goes into the accountant's office, the inventory, the planning. I mean, there's just no slippage there. That, that's a, you know, it's kind of a brilliant uh, plan. I, I think we're going to get more Walmarts. The, uh, I think it's very interesting that Home Depot and Target and uh, one or two others are in the top 50 uh, Fortune 500 clubs. Fortune 500 uh, companies. So Walmart has had successful imitators too. Where do I put the, the, the stock market? In? Well, I think it's absolutely essential for the companies to, when they want to raise money, it also gives an enormous number of people a chance to participate in the profits of, of, uh, that are generated by companies. Um, I don't know how you could, I don't know how, I suppose there's another way to do it. I don't think there's a more efficient way to share the ownership and to um, have access to the capital. Well, I think it's another one of those uh, panics, bubble burst, that is the result of the fact that no one is in charge and you had a very strong sense of incentives that were pulling people into riskier and riskier um, behavior. And you had a government that was complicit, one deregularizing the banks and also pushing for home ownership in a kind of mindless way. When I heard that there were Nina loans, no income, no assets, I realized that they really had you know, just thrown all caution to the winds. So I think it's a, it's a convergence. Um, capitalism does not correct itself. It needs regulation. And I, 
that was it was a great failure. I think we'll always have panics, but as someone pointed out very recently, we had controlled most of the recessions up until 2008, so the, since the recession, and we'd done it because of the Federal Reserve System. We'd done it because of mechanisms we had in place. It just didn't work this time around.